Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here, back for another segment of It's Getting Real. January 13th, 2010 at 4.30 p.m., a Rockdale County Sheriff deputy was driving his normal route when he was flagged down by 16-year-old Tasmaya and Jasmaya Whitehead. They ran over to his car, panicking and unable to breathe. They were in obvious distress. The girls reported their mother, Jarmika Yvonne Whitehead, 34, was murdered. Jarmika Yvonne Whitehead was better known to her loved ones as Nikki, was born on April 18th, 1975, to her mother, who at the time was 21 years old and her name was Linda Whitehead. Now, it's significant to mention that her mother was serving a sentence for drug possession and robbery. So she was actually born in prison. Not that that's an excuse for anything that happens, but it just goes to show you the history a little bit of the family. As a result, after her birth, her grandmother, Della Frazier, some call her Della Horton, at the age of 41, got custody and raised her in Georgia. Goes to show you how young they all were because at 41, you're getting custody of your grandchild. According to Della, raising Nikki wasn't easy. She was described as rambunctious, beautiful, extremely smart and free-spirited. But once she got into high school, things began to change. I'm sure that Nikki probably had some issues as well, considering that her mother was incarcerated and she was being raised by her grandmother. And people tend to handle things like that in different ways. So maybe Nikki acted out a little bit. So she started hanging out, partying and experimenting with drugs. And then at the age of 17, she found out that not only was she pregnant, but she was pregnant with twins. I personally would be mortified. So on November 27th, 1993, she gave birth to Tasmaya and Jasmaya Whitehead. They went by Taz and Jazz, and that's what I'm going to call them for the duration of this video. So I do not butcher their names. So shortly after they were born, her relationship ended with the father of the kids. And he did what some men do, and he left. Some women do it as well. Let me make that clear. It's not just men. But in this instance, it was a man. So I'm sure that created issues for the girls later on as well. But I will not allow that to be an excuse as to why certain things transpired. So despite him leaving, the girls still thrived in the beginning. Just like Nikki, they lived with Della. Now, Nikki was there too, but their dynamic wasn't so much as a mother and daughter dynamic. It was more like siblings because, you know, of the age difference. They loved living with their great grandmother and they were thriving. It was said that Nikki wanted more for her kids. So she was present, but her grandmother tend to take on a lot of the responsibility, which is not always good. I'm a firm believer that if these kids are grown enough to have relations as teens, then once certain things happen like a baby, then you need to allow them to parent. Now, I was not a teenager when I had my child, but I was young. I was in my, my lower 20s. And one of the things that I took it upon myself to do was to make sure that I established very early on that I I was going to parent him. It wasn't anybody else's responsibility, not mine, my, not my man's. I was going to parent him. Now, I wanted, let me not say not my man's because it was his responsibility to do it. But whether he did it or not, I was going to make sure that I was there for my child. So Nikki was young when she had them. She wasn't ready to be a full-time mom. So she continued to party and worked, but she did take care of her girls Eventually working in cosmetology, she worked at a Decatur's Simply Unique Salon in Georgia. Della and Nikki made sure that the girls stayed busy so they wouldn't get into trouble the way that Nikki and her mom previously did. So they were in dance class and they were in Girl Scouts and they were enrolled in various activities that would keep them busy. They made straight A's. As a result, they were honorable students. And for the most part, in the younger years, they stayed out of trouble. 
So in the year of 2000, 25-year-old Nikki met 55-year-old truck driver Robert Head. Um, I personally think that it's a big age gap, but they had their situation and they made it work. Despite him being a truck driver, despite the, the distance, they fell in love and continued to date. So Nikki would be at his home most of the time while their girl stayed with her, you know, sometimes, but more so with their great grandmother. At some point, she suggested that the girls live with them in Conyers, Georgia. Now, of course, at 12 and 13, because that's around the time this happened, you do not want to be uprooted and move away from all that you've known. Even though it was only a 30-minute move, that would mean that some things would change and now stay with your mother and her boyfriend. We can't act like we don't understand why there may be some issues here. This entire time, Nikki has been in and out, and now she wants to parent them on a permanent basis. So, of course, there would be some resentment there. I know I personally have been in the position where I live with my auntie and my uncle, and I was told that I had to move back with my mom. And I knew that for me, I had some resentment there because they were willing to allow me to stay with them. But my mom was out of jail and she wanted me back. And I didn't want to be back. I wanted to stay where I was because I was thriving and I had my friends and I had a freedom that I hadn't known before because I was just able to be. I didn't have to worry about what was going on with her. I could just enjoy being a kid. So there is resentment that builds up, but at no point should that have turned into what it turned into. The girls like being able to be with their great grandma because of course, while they're at their great grandmother's house, they have a certain level level of freedom. She didn't really have much control over them. So the girls were smoking and the girls' grades were dropping and they were dating older boys. Initially raised by their great grandmother, Della had some things to say in regards to Nikki. She said that Nikki was a sporadic and random presence in the children's lives. So in 2007, when the twins were 13 and Nikki was granted custody, she was confused. Nikki, Nikki, Nikki stood her ground and made sure that the twins moved in with her. So she thought that this would be, you know, a great beginning for them and that things would get better for them. But instead it got worse because they didn't want to be with her. They felt like their mom did the very things that they were doing now and that she's complaining about. So they should be able to do it too. So they basically went from sweet girls to little terrors, okay? So one night when the girls were supposed to be sleeping, Nikki did what parents do. She walked in, you know, go check on her kids. And she realized that Jazz had snuck out. So Nikki ends up calling 911, finds out later that Jazz spent the night over her boyfriend's house. Let me point out to you that at one point when I think it was Tasmina, uh, Taz was 16, her boyfriend was 19. So they've been doing this for a long time. So here it is, her 13-year-old at the time is has snuck out and spent the night at her boyfriend's house. Now, there is no way at 13, at any time really, that I could ever fathom doing that. Being 13, sneaking out to be at a boy's house was the last thing that I, was on my mind. So Nikki decided like, okay, you want to sneak out? I'm going to punish you. And her way of doing that was taking the phone as punishment. And of course, the girls acted out even more. So there was lots of arguments and fights. It was noted that on June 2008, uh, Nikki was attacked by her daughters. You heard me right. She was attacked. The police officer, which happens to be a woman, comes over, questions the girls, and she says that in questioning them, Nikki seemed upset, but the girls seemed extremely calm. And as she was talking about it, talking to them about it, something about it just didn't feel right to her. So they lied and said they didn't do anything, whereas Nikki's like, yes, they did. So the officer felt like there was nothing she could do in this situation because there was no evidence and it was Nikki's word against her kids, and she decided to leave. But because she didn't feel good about it, she sat outside for a little bit. So while the officer is outside and the twins nor Nikki know this, 
Nikki is attacked again and she ends up telling the officer later that the girls jumped her and scratched her and dragged her across the floor. There is no way that those girls would be in my house. If you're willing to attack me, then all bets are off and I'm either going to have to attack you or you're going to have to get out because I'm not going to let one, let alone two kids beat up on me. Oh, did I mention they're identical twins? Yeah, I'm not going to let them do that, okay? So the officer runs in and sees that Nikki is crying with all these scratches all over her neck and chest. I'm telling you those girls would have been out of my house in one way or another. So the girls were arrested because the officer then had proof and taken to juvenile court. Now, the smart thing would be to make these girls serve some time, put their little butts in some form of anger management, get a psychological done, see what the underlying issues are. But that's not what the judge did. Instead, what the judge did was the judge decided to do something that he or she, because I can't remember what it was, felt would be beneficial. And that's put the girls back in the care of Della. Y'all heard me right. Back in the care of Della, which is exactly what they wanted. Way to go, judge. Way to go. You did it. You gave the girls exactly what they wanted. You gave them back to their mom. They're, they're, well, they're not their mom. They're great grandma. And now they can move as they want to move. So despite being attacked by her kids, Nikki still wanted them to be a family. So she wanted to do counseling and therapy and they were ordered to do the counseling but of course, while they're in the counseling, because this is what they do, they were on their best behavior. And to be fair, counseling does require for all parties to be willing to do the work. It requires for you to want to change. And these girls did not want to change. So some people may say that Nikki deserved, you know, to have these problems with her girls or she asked for this because she was in and out of the girls' lives. But in my opinion, there's no excuse for what they later do. So they continue to live with Della and get to do whatever they want to do, skipping school so much that it later becomes a problem because the school is noting their absences and ends up having to report this. Nikki would come over and try to parent from time to time, but Della would not enforce any of the rules that Nikki suggested. As a result, Nikki is frustrated about this. They end up falling out Nikki then reconnects with her biological mother. About a year and a half after Jazz and Taz are, you know, doing all of this, they end up back in court yet again because of the truancy charge. Because they're skipping class so much, as I said, that the school has made the courts aware. Now, what happens after that is a snowball effect. So in January um, 2010, on the 5th, they decide to take uh, their great-grandmother's rights away from her and they give the kids back to Nikki, which of course ends up building more resentment because they feel like the court does, like Della is too you know, old to manage these out-of-control girls. Now, if nothing has been fixed, how do the courts feel like them being put right back in their mother's home will rectify the situation. So Jazz and Taz are livid. They're pissed. They're so pissed that they go off in the courthouse. Yeah, you heard me right. They go off in the courthouse because they do not want to go home with their mother. They don't want their rules. They don't want her. They make a scene to the point where other people hear this. One person even reports that they overheard Jazz saying that if I have to live with you, know, you I'm going to kill you to their mom. So you would think that something would be done then. You would think that maybe the judge, instead of putting them back, you know, to their mom, would put their little butts in the detention center until they get an attitude adjustment, have them go through actual therapy, have them do a psychological, really assess the situation. But no, Nikki regains custody of her children and she's happy, but she's nervous. And she tells some of her friends that she's nervous. She tells some of her friends that she's scared because she had been attacked so many times in various ways, whether verbally or physically by the young ladies, that she was afraid that they would do something with her. At the time, 
having no idea that her life was about to completely turn upside down nikki's goal is to do what like so many other parents would do which would be to try to make things right so the judge tells the girls, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a two-week period to see how things go, and then we'll reassess from there. But seeing how, as the last time they were home, they attacked her, I still don't think that this was the answer. So what Nikki does is Nikki does what some parents do, and she tries to, you know, put on a brave face. She says, you know what? I'm going to throw them a little party. So she throws them a welcome home party, and one of the twins don't even stay for it. So that twin wastes no time to act out yet again. She knows the girls are there. She has a lock on her bedroom door, according to her friend, because she doesn't want her daughters to come in and just attack her. It's way too much going on um, that they wouldn't be in my house. So mind you, on the 5th is when they went to court. Here it is, and it's the 12, and Jazz and Taz decide that they're going to go to a party with their friends. It's a school night, but they're going to go party with their friends. They don't end up coming back home until the next morning at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's now the 13th, right? Nikki wakes them up later, tells them whether they hung out late or not, they got to go to school. I'm with Nikki. Y'all want to act grown? You want to be out in these streets acting like you're grown? Then do what grown people do. They party, they come home, they sleep, they get up and they handle their responsibilities. And your responsibility is school. Now go to school. Now me personally, my kids wouldn't be out on a school night partying at 16. They probably wouldn't be out partying at all. I'm, I'm, I just got to be honest because I'm that parent who even the other day I took uh, my son who's 17 to his friend's birthday pool party and i'm the mom that wants to to know like okay what he's a, oh his father's an officer oh okay you know the, uh, oh yeah they live here all right yeah I, I need to know who your parents are i'm that person i i need i need to because these things matter right so anyways they get into an argument again because she's waking them up to go to school and they don't want to go so let me pick up where I started. So on January 13th, 2010, the twins waved down a cop car passing by their home, claiming they had walked into a crime scene. I understand that they walked into this because some point, and I need y'all to realize this, some point of that day they were at school, which means Nikki was successful in waking them up and sending them off to school. But was she really? So the the twins came home from school and they discovered Nikki was dead. Now, officers say that it was the bloody, one officer said that it was the bloodiest scene that I think I've ever been to. That came from Lieutenant Chris Moon with the Conyers Police Department. They walk in the house, immediately see pools of blood on the carpet, along with drag marks on the carpet. From the carpet leading all the way to the master bedroom, they note that there's blood spatter that covers the walls ceilings and furniture so understand that whoever did this attack was vicious things were on the floor blood was all over the place and their mother was in a bathtub deceased now let me be clear the report says that nikki suffered over 80 stab wounds she was stabbed over 80 times i'll say and her spinal cord as a result was almost severed so this was a brutal attack now if you like me and you like crime shows then a lot of us know that they say with things like this that it tends to be personal so they always tend to look closer than further out when it's this brutal so according to the officers, as soon as you open the door, you can smell both blood as well as bleach, which means at some point, somebody attempted to clean up something. But given what they see, what was clean? Police initially believed the girls claims that they discovered their mother dead in their home. On the recordings done at the police station, you hear them saying, here, come sit over here. Here, sweetheart, you can come sit over here because the girls have just lost their mother. They believe that these children were distraught because of what they walked into. The twins then described those scenes to police. So Taz said, I heard my sister scream and all I said was blood all over the floor. I looked and there was blood in front of the door, like a, a line of blood, like someone had dragged her in there like it's on tv the girls are putting on an act 
I mean, you see them crying, you see them embracing, you see them saying they want their grandma. The cops thought that, you know, it was a possibility that it could be their father, but they saw real quickly, okay, he doesn't live here, he's in Canada. The twins tell the cops, oh, it could have been, you know, one of her boyfriends because she has two, so it could be one of them. This is how cunning these girls are, that they have prepared and are prepared and quickly do throw other people under the bus for a crime that they committed. Yeah, you heard me right. They did this. They say Robert, who is the owner of the home, found out that Nikki was cheating on him. So he probably did it. But cops questioned that situation, quickly looked at that. At that, He has an alibi because he's not even around. And they get him off. Cops continued their line of questioning and they're watching them. And they start to become a little suspicious of the twins, feeling like something isn't adding up because something doesn't seem right. They even at one point caught one of them biting herself. And she said it's because that's how she copes when she's stressed. So the girls are holding each other on the video. They're hugging each other. You see at one time, one of them kisses the other one's cheek. And one of the officers look at them and sees them and says, you know, what can we do to help make you feel better? And you know what they ask? They ask if they could watch CSI. That would be the last thing I would want to see after walking into a crime scene where my mother was very maliciously murdered. Let me tell y'all something. It was the hardest thing for me when one of my friends was murdered, right? To the point where I have always loved crime TV. Like love loved it to the point where it's a bad habit. I even go to sleep to it playing in the background. The thought of watching anything crime related after he was murdered, the way he was, was the last thing that I wanted to do. So to hear these young ladies who just walked in on this crime scene that was horrible, like it's a lot of blood, you guys, to say, oh, if we watch CSI, we'll feel better. Of course, that's going to make the officers feel like what in the world? One of the detectives said that when he heard it, that he felt the, the hairs on his arm stand up because this was his first time realizing like, okay, something isn't right here. So they, they noticed then how the girls speak ill of their mom and how they're crying, but they don't see tears. Then they noticed that both girls are wearing gloves and they asked them to take them off. And that's when they see scratches on one of their hands. And that twin quickly says, she did it, pointing to her sister. There's a set of officers questioning them at the station, of course. And then you have the set of officers and the forensic team that are at the home. So at the home, they notice some troubling things. They notice that even though there is blood all over the place, that the sinks are completely clean. They notice that in the girl's closet, there are sneakers. One of the girl's closet, there are sneakers in the back of the closet that have had blood on them. In Taz's bedroom, there are brown boots with blood that are all over them that they find in a shoebox. Not only that, but they find a napkin that was stuffed in the toe of the shoe. They pull that out and in that napkin, they find a clump of hair wrapped up within the napkin. So now they're looking like, okay, these girls are definitely lying. Something happened here. They tell them to retrace their steps for the day. They tell the officers, we missed the bus, so we had to walk. In 2010, there are cameras. They're more visible. So you can see, you know, them sometimes at gas stations and wherever else. Now, there weren't as many ring lights. I don't even know if ring lights were around then. So they might have been, you know, okay or whatever. But the point is, there was surveillance, right? So they say they left the house. Surveillance. So they said they left the house at 7.30. They walked to school. But the surveillance camera from the gas station shows that not them not walking, but them getting in a car to catch a ride to school. And I'm like, okay, that's a dumb lie. So the camera from school shows that they got there after 10, like 10.30-ish. 
Police eventually separate the girls, asking them questions individually, and they're separated. So now the stories are a little different. So Jazz tells cops, you know, that, you know, part of the reason why she had the bite is because she would bite her hands when she was nervous. While Taz says on the recording, you can hear her saying stupid scratch. They're going to blame this whole thing on me because of a stupid scratch. Innocent people don't think these things. So... Earlier, the bite was her way of coping. But really what we found out later is that this was her way of trying to cover up things. So both girls were eventually released into the custody of their great grandma that night, which is crazy. But they did because they didn't they didn't have the results and all those other things. But even if they did have the results, you know, with twins and DNA, it's the same. They are identical. Being able to return to life is normal, go out with friends and hang out at school. So the police test the evidence why the girls do all these things. They even attend their prom. As I said, we find out that the bite was to cover up what she did. They found hair in Nikki's teeth, which shows that Nikki fought for her life. So months later, after all of this has happened, and the cops are building up a case. On the last day of school, they arrest the girls. On the day of their arrest, Conyers police have the recording going while the girls are in there by themselves and they're talking about things. And one of the things that's mentioned is the bite marks. And then you hear the day that you find a, a murder weapon with my fingerprint prints on it or something. That's when you can get me like, please do that. Please do that. Please find a murder rep weapon because it will be different for real. Just goes to show you the way that Taz and Jazz think. So at this point, they're kind of taunting the police. The twins later admitted to the crime in a horribly chilling confession. And as they're doing so, they have absolutely no remorse. So this is their version of things. Some of it may not be true because they lied about other stuff. So we're just going to go with the version that we heard on the tape. So they told officers that the incident began with a fight with their mother after they woke up late for school. She told them they can't do what they want and they need to live by her rules. The girls claimed that Nikki threatened them with the pot that had been on the stove. They were all mad and they were just yelling back and forth. And at some point, Nikki grabbed the pot. Taz took it from her because... More than likely, she didn't just grab a pot to grab a pot. They were probably threatening her, acting like they were going to fight her. She's already been attacked by them on more than one occasion. So she probably grabbed that pot as a way to protect herself. So Taz takes the, the pot. So then Nikki grabs a knife and tells them to back up. That alone, to me, should have stopped things. But those girls wanted her. They wanted to get at her. They were so mad. They didn't want to be with her. They were still upset about what happened at court. They wanted what they wanted. So she grabs the knife, says, get back. But some kind of way, the knife didn't stay in her hand, according to Taz. Her mom is, is, is winning the battle, so she says, with the knife. I don't understand how the mom is winning the battle with the knife if the knife didn't stay in her hand. Which shows she, at some point... Probably they took the pot and knocked the knife out of her hand or something like that. She says, so because she's winning the battle with the knife, I hit her with the pot. Then at some point, Nikki bit her in the chest. So I'm trying to punch her. And then Jazz says, I guess that's when Taz stabbed her. She stabbed her. Says her sister, Jazz who then says she began strangling her mother with a ribbon and a medallion. So both of them are stabbing her. Because Jazz is saying that Taz stabbed her and Taz is saying that Jazz stabbed her. So they both stabbed her. And then you hear, I think I was stunned. They claim that their mother, you know, hit her. Jazz says, so I think I was stunned and I picked up the knife and I think I stabbed her. But they, they, her words, they wasn't cuts like, they wasn't deep because I couldn't bring myself to do that. How do you think they managed to stab someone so much that her spinal cord is almost severed if it wasn't deep? So at some point, the mom runs to the neighbors to try to get help. He heard the knocking, but he did not get up to help. 
We got to do better as neighbors, y'all. We have to. If someone is knocking on your door, even if you don't want to be bar uh, bothered, get up and go see because you never know what the situation may be. And I would like to think if the roles were reversed and someone was knocking on my door, I would help them. I know many years ago when my neighbor was getting beat up that I called the cops immediately. I even was prepared to, you know, grab what I needed to grab if said be because I heard the neighbor getting up and this, uh, getting beat up. And this was a lady that I didn't even know. She hadn't even been in the apartment complex that long, but you could hear it in the hallway. And my son came running and saying something about it. So he too was concerned. We have to care more about humanity. Love and compassion goes a really, really long way. And one of the things that bothers me about this situation is if they were doing all of this, if if they were yelling and if this, the scene was as bad as it was, then that means someone had to hear something. Because the neighbor admits to hearing the knocking and doing nothing. They even saw the footprints on the ground from where she was standing when she was knocking. <sighs> I don't think that that knock was normal. I think that that was a knock from terror and shame on the neighbor for not answering it. The twins then dragged their mother back into the house uh and into the bathtub. They said there her last words to them was that she hates them and that they're going to jail. But then her, she went under a couple of times and that was that. That was it, said Jazz. So callous. Both were charged with voluntary manslaughter because they admitted to the crime and making false statements and possession of a knife during a crime. Taz pled guilty in January 2014 and is serving a 30-year sentence at um our Arendelle State President, while Jazz pleaded in February 14th and is at Paluska State Prison. Della is still close with the girls. And I just feel like I'm not saying you got to completely cut them off, but Della at no point stopped being close with the girls. How much did you value your granddaughter that your great granddaughters can plot on her, do the things that they did, and you're still close with them? There is such a thing called tough love. She's even on film speaking highly of Jazz when she's at her high school uh, graduation in jail, getting her high school diploma, the grandma speaking so highly of them. I feel like Della is and was part of the problem. They, kill, they killed your granddaughter and you're over there praising them when we all know and the officers know that this was premeditated. They found a journal journal entries from the girls where they were writing back and forth in the journals talking about wanting to kill their mom. So in my opinion, 30 years isn't enough. 30 years is not enough. I feel bad for Nikki. She probably looked at these beautiful girls as intelligent children and thought that at some point, if she keep trying, if she keep working, that she would reach them. Probably thinking that I'm going to ride through this rough patch. And then after I'm done with this rough patch, we're going to have this time. We're going to go do the counseling and the things that we need to do. And they're going to see that I love them. I'm here for them and I want to be better for them. Or at the very least, keep them from going through the things that I went through and, and experiencing the things that I experienced. I don't want them to be teen moms. I don't want them to continue to use drugs. I want them to go to Yale and Harvard and the places that they want to go only for in the last moments of her life, realize that those two beautiful daughters that at one point she held as babies now were the reason why life was being taken from her. Linda's mother um, not Linda's mother, Linda Whitehead, which is Nikki's mother said, I've lost my oldest child. I've lost my first set of grandkids. I always saw them at Harvard or Yale. Never would I have imagined ever that they would be sitting in a jail cell, which is the irony of it all because at one point their grandmother was sitting in a jail cell. This story is crazy to me because in the various variations of it, one thing remains the same and is that these girls killed their mother. And even in killing their mother, they had opportunities where they could stop doing what they were doing, but they didn't. 
The scene alone shows that Nikki was fighting for her life and she was a getting she was getting attacked left and right by both of those girls. I can't imagine how I would feel as a mom having my precious child do that to me. And here it's not one, but it's the both of them. What a slap in the face that is. I'm not saying that what Nikki did was perfect. Nikki made mistakes, but Nikki was trying. Nikki was trying to, to save her girls and prevent them from going through what she went through. And unfortunately, at a lot of different turns, she was failed. And I just feel like we got to see things for what they are. If you look at a lot of these people who commit these crimes, if you see them, even on some of their mug shots, a lot of them don't look like people who would commit crimes. We have to understand that there really are people who are just severely damaged. And I feel like these twins, wherever they go after they get out, because 30 years isn't long, I feel like people need to know where they are. Because if they did this to their mom, what would they do to you? Thank you all so much for watching. Until next time.